Yamashita's gold is one of the greatest treasure hoards ever known. In today's currency, it represents over a hundred billion dollars in value. According to the myth, this incredible fortune was amassed from proceeds of ruthless Japanese looting throughout Asia during World War II. For one amateur treasure hunter, finding the gold becomes a lifelong obsession. But little did he know, he has a mighty rival. One of the most brutal dictators of the 20th century. Marcos was unquestionably a thug. He was a gangster. This is the extraordinary story of Roger Rojas and the legend of Yamashita's gold. The legend of Yamashita's gold is one of the greatest stories of war loot in history. By 1942, the Japanese Imperial Army has successfully invaded all of Southeast Asia. As they advance, they mercilessly ransack country after country. They steal on a massive scale, reportedly unrivaled in military history. Yamashita's gold is wealth beyond belief. People wouldn't believe how much it is. One trillion US dollars worth. So it's a mind-blowing amount. The mastermind heading this covert operation, codenamed the Golden Lily, is said to be Prince Chichibu, the emperor's brother. This guy is brilliant. Prince Chichibu was a perfect choice to head up the Golden Lily because he wasn't just a military man. He was an Oxford scholar, and he brought an incredible amount of creativity and lateral thinking to how we'll go about this complex process of looting. The Golden Lily operatives just completely took everything from all the countries. They left him with nothing. They invaded. They took all their wealth and just left them penniless. It wasn't just banks and financial institutions, but it also had museums, temples, art galleries, rare books, anything that was worth money. They knew about it, knew where it was, how much it was worth, and they took it. The Golden Lily's looting was so comprehensive, they even targeted the underworld, the gangster world, the black markets, and they absolutely drained them of anything that was of value. Having amassed treasures of all shapes and sizes, the Golden Lily's mission is far from over. They need to get it back home to Japan. First, they melt the gold into easy-to-move ingots. But this smelting also serves a shadier purpose. When gold is made, it's stamped, and you can tell where it came from. But when it's been re-smelted, you, you don't know where it came from. They so wanted to stamp a little sign on the gold bars that the gold was actually made in Japan. Then it would look like the gold was Japanese gold of Japanese origin. The stolen gold is then brought to the Philippines. There, it is inventoried and sent on to Japan by ship. The Philippines was chosen as the Golden Lily's transportation hub because it was pretty much in the center of the vast Japanese empire. For the first year of operations, the Golden Lily's transportation network runs like clockwork. But then, the tide of the war turns. In June 1942, Japanese and U.S. forces meet near the tiny Pacific island of Midway. Over just four days, the U.S. forces sink five Japanese ships. 
they destroy 270 aircraft and kill 3,500 men. The Japanese have lost control of the seas. Now it is too risky for them to ship the gold home. They need a new plan. They turn to their finest fighting general, Tomoyuki Yamashita. He has an incredible track record. Nobody has the reputation he does. And if anyone can pull one out of the hat, it would be him. With the gold now stuck in the Philippines, Yamashita is being asked to come up with a miracle. The story goes he is told to hide the gold until it is safe to move it. He identifies 175 suitable burial sites across the Philippines. They will hold the gold until the Japanese are once again victorious. And the Philippines proved the ideal place to hide this treasure. They put it in very isolated parts throughout the Philippines, mostly covered by very mountainous terrain and a thick, thick jungle. Once you got these tunnels built, it would become virtually impossible to see that there had been anything ever buried there because of the, of the growth rate of the, in the jungle. Yamashita orders detailed maps to be made of the exact location of each treasure vault. And each map is carefully encoded. These maps were done in a old Japanese dialect called Kanji, a language which is between 1500 and 2000 years old. And there were no topographical references on them. They used the old characters to represent certain landmarks. Unless you know the complex code, these maps are meaningless. And there are even further layers of security. Bombs, grenades, decoy walls that would lead you into another trap. The Golden Lily left nothing to chance, and they had a vast system of booby traps that consisted of poisonous gas, explosives, complex use of the water table. So if you don't know what you're doing, you're going to drown in your pursuit of reaching the treasures. But the maps that were drawn highlighted where all those traps were. If you didn't have a map and you went into one of these uh, treasure vaults, it's very likely that you wouldn't come out alive. And to ensure all the treasure vault locations remain top secret, the number of people in the know is ruthlessly kept to a minimum. They use prisoner of war or local slave labor to build the actual treasure vaults. And the people who are building it don't know why, but that's irrelevant. They're going to die anyway. So they're usually killed, shot on the spot. Yamashita's efforts, the gold still isn't safe. In October 1944, the Americans land in the Philippines. The fighting that follows is the bloodiest of the Pacific War. The fighting in the Philippines at the end of the war was extremely brutal. Yamashita would fight to the very last man for the emperor. But even a master tactician like Yamashita can't stop the Americans' advance. 
The Philippines has 7,000 plus islands and is very, very difficult to defend against an invading force. Yamashita, as a great general, would have known that. He knew he couldn't hold the Philippines. All he could do was drag out the fight for as long as possible. Yamashita needs to buy himself time. He still hasn't finished burying the gold. April 1945. The Japanese are losing the war in the Pacific. Japanese General Tomoyuki Yamashita's priority now is to hide the looted gold. While U.S. naval forces continue to advance, Yamashita is forced to retreat back to the mountains around the northern city of Baggio. Their systematic hiding of their national treasure becomes less systematic and more panicked. They need to do it immediately because they're about to suffer defeat. 174 treasure vaults done and dusted. Only one is left. With time running out, Yamashita orders the chief engineers to seal the final treasure vault. These engineers knew everything. They knew how the maps were made. They knew where the burial sites were. They knew how they were booby trapped. What they don't know is that Yamashita has one last move to protect the gold. The story goes that while the engineers are carrying out his orders, Yamashita seals the vault himself. The engineers are still inside. Now they will be its guardians for eternity. Three months later, World War II is over. General Yamashita is put on trial for war crimes. The commission finds you guilty as charged and sentences you to death by hanging. Yamashita takes the secrets of the gold to his grave. There is only one other person who allegedly knows of the gold's whereabouts. Prince Chichibu. And in 1953, he dies of TB. Anybody who knew anything about this treasure is now dead. It seems Yamashita's gold is lost forever. But in the Philippines, after the horrors of war, the legend of Yamashita's gold lives on. There were lots and lots of rumors that the Japanese had buried treasure all over the Philippines. It's almost a national obsession. Everybody across the country is aware of it, and everyone's looking for it. Among those who grew up with stories about the gold is a young Filipino locksmith. Rogelio Rojas, better known as Roger, is born in 1943, just as Yamashita's gold is being buried. Roger's childhood was really difficult. The Philippines are extremely impoverished. His family is impoverished. Roger is one of millions of Filipinos growing up in the shadow of World War II. The war had devastated the Philippines. Manila was absolutely on its knees in a way that no other city in the whole of the Second World War, other than Warsaw. It was dreadful. Hundreds of thousands killed, families broken up. Desperate poverty, no real economy going. Um, it was in a really bad state. So it was no surprise that the legend of Yamashita's gold just took Roger by by heart at a very young age, someone that poor with a possibility of obtaining wealth beyond your wildest dreams, of course you're gonna go for it.
Roger the locksmith lives in Baggio, the northern city near to where Yamashita made his last stand. Roger surmises that they must have hid some of the treasure around his town. So he looks around his town right from the start because he knows logically that's probably one of the best places to start. Roger was a very diligent man. Every spare moment he was out there working, seeing what he could find, eliminating areas, and continuing to move forward in a very logical, progressive manner. To help him in his quest, Roger scrimped and saved and bought himself a metal detector. Yet all Roger has ever managed to find are a few old coins and some Japanese ammunition. But that doesn't shake his faith. One day he is sure he will come across the treasure he's been dreaming of since he was a boy. No matter how many disappointments a treasure hunter has, they will always keep going. Then, in 1961, after years of hunting the gold, Roger has what seems to be a breakthrough. He gets the kind of clue he'd been longing for, a map of a tunnel complex. There are lots of maps and sketches like this in treasure hunting circles at the time. Roger has seen plenty of them before, but all have been fakes. This one is different. This map had come from a Japanese soldier. He's convinced that this is the real deal. The problem is, the map is in the Golden Lily's fiendishly complex code. It's a needle in a haystack, and you don't even know where the haystack is because the map has no topographical features. But Roger also knows that this Japanese soldier had been in Baggio with a group of engineers as they buried gold during the final days of Yamashita's retreat. A map allegedly related to one of those treasure vaults. It was getting closer. He could feel it. Roger never gives up. And the reason is he knows the treasure is there. And he knows that year after year, if nothing else, he's eliminating where it isn't. Yet for all his high hopes, Roger just can't crack the map's code. After years of searching, he is no closer to finding Yamashita's gold. But at least the map confirms to Roger his initial instincts are right. There is treasure somewhere around Baggio. While combing the jungles around Baggio, Roger Rojas finally gets the clue he's been searching for, a cryptic map of the tunnel complex used to hide gold taken by the Japanese during World War II. Then Roger meets a man who seemed to offer him his next breakthrough, Eusebio Okubo. Okubo tells Roger he served under the Japanese as an interpreter during their occupation of the Philippines. There were a lot of Filipinos who claimed to know where Japanese buried treasure was, uh, mainly because an awful lot of Filipinos had perforce worked with the Japanese, not necessarily what we would call collaborators, but simply because the Japanese needed cooks, drivers, interpreters, all that sort of thing. Okubo confesses he served none other than General Yamashita. While working for him, Okubo had witnessed Yamashita taking a large quantity of gold to Baggio towards the very end of the war. And then Okubo reveals the crucial piece of information Roger was after. The gold was in wooden boxes, stashed in a tunnel not far from Baggio General Hospital. So this was the final link. This allowed him to tie the bow together and have the perfect package. Now he knows where to go. He knows where to dig. 
he was elated because it now pinpointed the area for him to look at. But little does Roger know, he has a rival. The most powerful man in the Philippines, President Ferdinand Marcos. In 1965, Marcos had been democratically elected, but rapidly became a pathologically greedy dictator. Money was extremely important to Ferdinand Marcos. He loved it like nothing else. And there is only one person who can match Marcos's greed, his shopaholic wife, Imelda. But Imelda's lavish lifestyle wasn't the only reason Marcos needed money. The richer you were, the more powerful you were. It's that simple. It's a very simple equation. And nothing can make Marcos more powerful than finding Yamashita's gold. It's not at all surprising that Marcos was interested in Yamashita's gold because he was a thug, basically, and the mere thought of the promise of gold, and he would have been onto it like a shot. Compared to Roger, Marcos has a serious advantage in the hunt for Yamashita's gold, power. It was incredibly easy for Marcos to use his power to find the gold. He has entire armies at his disposal. Armies, ships, experts on maps and deciphering all sorts of clues. Despite all these resources, Marcos hasn't found anything. And so he devises a shrewd strategy. He was a brilliant politician, but he was also brilliantly corrupt. On the surface, he seemed to be a rational person going by the law, by the books, but in person, he was quite ruthless. Marcos passes a law demanding treasure hunters apply for a permit, detailing where they're going to start digging. He comes up with the permit system because this way he has all the enthusiastic treasure hunters all across the country working for him because they've now told him where they think the treasure is. He's just waiting to see if anyone finds it, then he can move in because he has the resources to do that. And you know, that's very smart. Meanwhile, back in Baggio, in 1970, Roger marries. With a new wife and child on the way, he needs Yamashita's gold now more than ever. And so Roger dutifully applies for one of Marcos's permits. Roger did everything the right way. He thought that if he followed the rules that had been put in place by the government, he would be able to search, he would be able to find and excavate and recover, and it would all be done with the blessings of the government. In Rogers Town, the person who manages that application is none other than Marcos's uncle. In May 1970, armed with his permit, his map, and Okubo's information, Roger decides to risk everything to find Yamashita's gold. He spends all his life savings hiring a team of laborers. Together, they start hacking their way through the thick jungle vegetation near Baggio General Hospital. So it was really difficult for Roger to find the tunnel near the hospital because it was 25 years before that that it was blasted shut. And every single year in the rainy season, these jungles you know, they change their look and feel dramatically. Then, after two weeks of almost non-stop searching, Roger spots the mouth of a cave. Could this be the entrance to the treasure vault Okubo told him about? One hundred meters into the tunnel, a collapse means Roger can't go any further. But for Roger, this is a good sign. 
He knows the Japanese had used dynamite to blast their treasure vaults shut. And so Roger and his crew begin the arduous task of clearing the way. The conditions for Roger and the team digging in the tunnel would have been horrific. It was hot, there were insects, there were snakes. It was very, very hard work. Digging the tunnel was very, very dangerous. And Roger knew that if this really was a tunnel that the Japanese had built, there may be booby traps. But Roger is willing to risk his life to get to Yamashita's gold. Once you get that gold fever, it is insatiable. You just cannot quench that appetite. He was becoming obsessed. One more spade, one more rock. I'm going to get it. This is going to be the treasure of a lifetime. And everybody's going to say, yes, you found it. Finally, after four long months of digging, they break through. Roger Rojas has spent his life savings and every spare moment searching for the long lost hoard of looted Japanese treasure. Then, after weeks of backbreaking work, he makes a grim discovery. Skeletons dressed in rags. But these aren't just any rags. They are Japanese military uniforms. Could these be the remains of the engineers who had hidden Yamashita's gold only to be buried alive by Yamashita himself? He thinks he's there, and he knows now that he has all the pieces to the puzzle. He is literally at the threshold of the gold recovery that he has sought now for 10 years. It's there, it's within his fingertips grasp. Stretching beyond the skeletons are a vast network of tunnels. Roger and his team spend weeks exploring them. Day after day, they find nothing. But a full six months after finding the entrance to the tunnel, Roger still hasn't found any treasure. Roger had spent all the money that he had raised to start the dig to begin with, and no one was going to give him any more money. No money means no crew. It seems the hunt is over. Just before Roger decides to give up once and for all, he has one last go with his metal detector. Then he hears its telltale buzz. This buzz that Roger got from his metal detector must have been the best sound he'd ever heard in his life. Roger is stunned. Hiding behind the wall is a gold statue of Buddha. 
this was that moment in life that you would look back on and you say, yes, I have achieved my goal for my entire life. This is it. This find is the most significant find of anything that anybody had discovered in the Philippines. The Buddha is in the Burmese style. According to the legend, the Japanese had looted religious artifacts from temples right across Burma. He must have found one of Yamashita's 175 treasure vaults. And that wasn't all. The area around the Buddha was stacked full of wooden boxes. Finally, it was payday. The gold that Roger has just discovered is worth a fortune. Each of those bars is worth $1,000. And he estimated there were over 1,000 boxes of the gold bars. So you're talking an incredible amount of money, more treasure than even he ever dreamed he would find. I mean, this has surpassed his wildest expectations. Roger returns home with the Buddha, planning to go back for the gold with trucks and men. But the more he looks at the statue, the more curious Roger becomes. There's something about it that isn't quite right. The Buddha is full of diamonds. The value had just gone off the chart. That night, Roger documents his life-changing find. News of Roger's miraculous discovery soon spreads to the presidential palace. I can just imagine him going crazy when the word had gotten to him. Marcos was going to do anything to get that Buddha away from Rojas. And it was going to eventually sit in Marcos' palace. Unfortunately for Roger, Marcos's primary tactic is brute force. April 5th, 1971, it said a group of mysterious men turn up at Roger's house. They said, you have three minutes to open the door or we're going to shoot you right here. They took everything away from him. Can you imagine the feeling of violation his entire life he's looked for this he's found it and now it's been taken but if marcos thinks he can intimidate roger and his family he's wrong roger had risked everything to find this gold and he wasn't going to let it go so easily roger reports the theft to the police by that time, President Marcos had a considerable stranglehold on the police and the army particularly. But Marcos does not yet control the media. Within days, the press picks up Roger's story. It was a huge scandal. You know, there's stolen loot, it's World War II, it's the Japanese, it's Marcos being implicated. The newspaper was full of articles that were nothing short of calling Marcos a common thief. The hostile press coverage comes at a critical time for Marcos. He was widely known to have fixed his second term of office, the elections, which were ludicrously corrupt. I mean, he, he allegedly won by two million votes. It was just in, in, impossible. And he was widely lampooned on all sides for corruption, and um, he was beginning to feel himself quite insecure. Marcos needs to silence this treasure hunter fast. 
there is one obvious solution. The Marcos regime was notorious for extrajudicial executions. You'd have death squads basically killing people who were seen as being very critical of the regime. This time, Marcos needs a different approach. I think by that time, he must have thought that the story had enough public exposure for him not to be able to risk just making um, Roger vanish, like a lot of his opponents. Three weeks later, Roger finally receives some good news. He is told his Buddha is waiting to be collected at the courthouse in Baggio. But when he gets there, he is in for a shock. After a decade of searching, Roger Rojas has finally found Yamashita's gold only to have it mysteriously and forcefully taken away, seemingly by President Ferdinand Marcos. Weeks later, Roger hears that his Buddha is waiting to be collected at the courthouse in Baggio. When Roger saw the Buddha, he knew immediately this wasn't the Buddha that he'd found. It was a different color, different shape, facial expression. The head didn't come off. Marcos is expecting Roger to say, yes, that's the Buddha, thank you. But he didn't know Rojas. Rojas was determined he wasn't going to let that boot up. And this was a huge mistake for Marcos because he had misread Rojas' personality. Roger declares the Buddha is a fake. Really, this marks the beginning of the end for Roger. Just over two weeks later, more mysterious men come for Roger. Over several days, Roger says he was repeatedly burned with cigarettes. He was beaten. And electrocuted. Eventually, Roger claimed he signed an affidavit stating Marcos had nothing to do with the theft of his Buddha and revealed the location of the thousands of gold ingots. Roger was a very broken man when he signed that affidavit. I mean, there he was fighting publicly, but now admitting that no, there was no wrongdoing. He must have been completely demoralized. Marcos has Roger imprisoned and wastes no time helping himself to the rest of Roger's find. But eventually, Marcos's megalomania will prove his undoing. In 1986, a popular revolution forces Marcos and Imelda to flee the country. The Filipino people storm Marcos's presidential palace, and what they find inside is unbelievable. They were amazed at what they found. They found treasures of statues and art and thousands of pairs of shoes. This is just what they left behind. Marcos was by far and away the wealthiest man alive. One of the questions for the Filipino people was, where had the Marcos's enormous wealth come from? For most, there was an obvious answer. Marcos's wealth primarily came from theft, embezzlement, and corruption. And you can look back, I think, on their joint reign as simply being a plot of self-enrichment. And the um, administration of the Philippines was merely a secondary <laughs> item. <laughs> They were basically using the public treasury as their piggy bank. Years later, while on trial for fraud and embezzlement, 
Imelda Marcos' defense declares their fortune was not looted from the Philippine treasury, but actually came from finding Yamashita's gold. But for Roger Rojas, none of this matters. His life is in ruins. Roger never fully recovered from his torture. And the damage is so great that you know, he can't see out of his right eye for the rest of his life after this. He's lost his money, he's lost his self-respect, he's lost his wife. Roger has lost everything. Despite all this, Roger still has a bit of the spirit that had helped him find the gold. It's a treasure hunter's mentality. They must get to the end of the story. They must get the treasure. Anyway, Roger had lost so much, he had nothing to lose. With Marcos in exile in Hawaii, Roger files a lawsuit against him. Even when Marcos dies one year later in September 1989, the case continues. You could say that the Marcos is actually got away with it. He went out, lived his exile in Hawaii and died of natural causes. Um, you could well say that they did rather well out of it. It takes seven more years before Roger is at last vindicated. In 1996, the jury concludes Marcos had stolen Roger's find. $43 billion in damages is awarded. When the court finds in Roger's favor, it's a significant moment in legal history. $43 billion is awarded to Roger, which is the biggest civil lawsuit award in history. Sadly, Roger never sees justice done. On the eve of his day in court, he dies. He is just 49 years old. Then, in 1998, the huge compensation award is overturned. While no court has challenged the verdict that Marcos stole Roger's treasure, how to determine its value is still being fought out by the lawyers. It's hard not to look back at Roger and feel empathy for this man. His determination was boundless. And I think, if nothing else, Roger was a hero. And I think that's how he's gonna be remembered. He was willing to be David against Goliath. He was willing to put his life on the line and therefore my hat off to him. Roger's tragic story begs the question, was what he found a one-off? Or, as the legend states, are there another 174 treasure vaults still waiting to be discovered? Since the war, treasure hunters from across the world have scoured the Philippines, each in search of Yamashita's gold. Yet none of them has found anything. Nonetheless, people are still willing to risk their lives looking. Searching for Yamashita's gold is a very dangerous activity. Even to this day, I think it was in 2000, two men were buried alive looking for treasure. What drives them is their certainty that Yamashita's gold is still out there. <laughs>